Good morning once again, and welcome everyone to session four of the International Conference on Post-Pandemic Reforms in Medical Education for Accessible and Affordable Rural Healthcare. Our objective of this session is to enhance the quality of medical education system by developing national metrics to evaluate the credentials, reputation, performance, and the social impact of individual faculty, departments, programs, and institutions. The co-chairs for this session are Dr. Bharat, General Surgeon, Sri Satisai Sarla Memorial Hospital, and Dr. Arvind Dakshan, Senior Pediatrician, Sri Satisai Sarla Memorial Hospital. We now request the session co-chairs to commence the discussion. Over to you, sir. Good morning, all of you. I should say this is very interesting. We have been, since morning, mesmerizing discussions we had this morning. And it, I hope it will continue whole day, whole course. I know that. First of all, let me thank you and welcome all the delegates to today's discussion session. First, we have a virtual speaker coming from Kochi. First panelist is Dr. Krishna Kumar, clinical professor and head of pediatric cardiology department, Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences and Research Center, Kochi, India. He is going to, his topic is career advancement for faculty who serve as inspiring role model educators for medical students. I welcome Dr. Krishna Kumar. Good morning to those of you who are in the United States and good afternoon and good evening to the others from other parts of the world who may be listening in. Uh, I have to start by thanking uh, Professor Anand for this uh, remarkable opportunity to speak on a topic that I'm, I have to say is close to my heart. Because I've been a medical teacher uh, uh, for the last 25 years and have some very strong feelings about nurturing teachers. This is something I came to know fairly recently, that the word doctor in Latin is, is derived from dossier, which means to teach. And uh, so it's medical uh, profession and becoming a doctor is very intimately related to teaching. And this is another quote that I first came to know from my very, uh, from a colleague that I respect greatly, Dr. Kotari. A teacher influences eternity, and you can never tell where the influence stops. Uh, and I've really felt this all my life with some of the teachers. I got uh, this, these messages on July 13th, which uh, we celebrate in India as Guru Purnima. I had some of my students wish me and uh, send me these very nice messages, uh, which always makes me feel good and makes me feel that a lot of what I've been doing is actually been worthwhile. But one message stood out. And this is the message from Kabir, uh, which is a very famous Doha that we've all been taught as school children. Uh, Doha is the way Kabir often composed uh, couplets. And it actually translates into what Kabir says that a spiritual teacher or a guru is even greater than God. He says that if teacher and God are both in front of me, who would I greet first? He would say that he would greet the, the teacher first because only because of teacher's teaching am I able to see God. So this is symbolic in so many uh, profound ways. And it is at the core of why we deeply revere teachers in our country and perhaps in many other parts of the world. And it's I owe my uh, career and my development and who I am to some very great teachers and mentors. There's no question about it. All of us have stood 
on shoulders of teachers and become what we are. There's just no escaping from this fact. Uh, and, and it's particularly true for us doctors. So Dr. Tandon uh, was my guru, was my inspiration and was the reason why I took up pediatric cardio. He had such a profound impact on his students and not just me, but several students, several generations of students who never forget their encounter with him. Uh, I think it's best that we just look at his obituary that I was fortunate to write it with, again, another very great teacher, Dr. Kothari. And I just will have some quotes from his obituary, which is essentially that he's influence went way beyond cardiology or pediatric cardiology and touched the core of the student's being. He was never a strict disciplinarian. He just was so spontaneous and easy, but at the same time, just being with him uh, really was something that we all enjoyed. And nobody had a sense of fear. He would get the best out of everybody without with, with that most ease. He also set very high standards of academic honesty and professional conduct as a teacher. One of his famous quotes was, never humiliate your student in public. And actually, he never violated this axiom, even in private. His commitment to teaching was unparalleled. And he was very humble. I mean, that's something that was very, very stark, simple, Simplicity in him and humility was not put on. It was just innate. Something we, <laughs> it's hard to cultivate that. But the important thing that I, I recognized and I visited Dr. Tandon's home after he passed away and his wife just shared some letters and pointed out to me that he got these requests for application for a number of awards, which he always declined. And he was... He never received any significant award all throughout his life, despite being without question the most revered teacher in the face of in, in the subject of cardiology in the country. So it's something that we needed to think about as to why, what motivated him. Not a teacher, I, I in fact I went to Boston largely because Dr. Tandon encouraged me to do so and facilitated. And Professor Jane Newberger was my mentor, of course, amongst many mentors at, uh, at Children's, but she was someone with whom I've had a lifelong mentor-mentee relationship. And what was striking about her was the deep, genuine, and heartfelt interest in the welfare of her students. That's something I, I did try to imbibe from her, but it's something that I think is very essential as a teacher. I will never forget my encounters with Professor Stan Perry, who is currently at Stanford. Stan wasn't easy. He was a very difficult person initially to work with. But he did something which very few teachers actually thought about doing, which is to create situations for the student and forcing the student to think on his or her own feet. And that was not necessarily a pleasant or an easy process, but had a lasting impact on training. So even 30 years from now, today, I think of a lot of things I do in the cath lab, I completely owe to Stan Perry. He taught me how to think. And so for that reason, he is amongst my greatest teachers and mentors. And I will draw parallels from history. And some of the best mentors would be perceived as tormentors initially because it's so hard. There isn't a better example in history than Bodhidharma, who was very famous as a, he, he took Buddhism to, from India to, the, uh, to China and to Japan and in Zen Buddhism took birth from Bodhidharma's teaching. In, in many ways, that's, that was the biggest influence. But he was, very similar from what I can read about him to what I saw in Stan. A very difficult person to work with, to be with, but at the same time left a tremendous impact on the teachers. So teachers come in different flavors and different types. 
in my undergraduate years, I recall Professor Chakravarti, who was uh, a, a remarkably enthusiastic. And the thing about him was his infectious uh, enthusiasm that that was that you just can't escape from. So in a class of 180 students, he would enthuse everybody with his lectures. And he is somebody that left an impact on, on, on all of us, a very large group of students who, who learned physiology from him. So essentially, what's a good teacher in medicine? And I think these four teachers sum up those qualities that Dr. Willis Hurst have list, has listed out. And I think it's, it's a very nice checklist. So the most important thing, they must be excited about the spirit of learning. They must be, they must have a, they must be a student themselves and pre, be excited about things, about new facts. And they should, of course, know their subject, but be willing to change even the strongest views that they have. It's something that I need to learn. And it's taken a while before I've also tried to uh, be not so fixated on my views. Must be interested in the law of lifelong development of a student. And that's, that's something that I experienced in Professor Neuberger. Must enjoy your work. There isn't much room for cynicism in teaching. If you transmit that cynicism and negativity, it has a tremendously poor influence on your students. So you have to enjoy your work. The impact must be felt many years after the teacher has gone. Now that's something that I realized with Stan Perry, with Raj Tandon, with all my teachers, where you just don't remember exactly what they taught you, but you remember their persona and you remember those qualities that you want to imbibe. And then, of course, must attract a student. So must, and all these attributes that I listed above attracts students, your enthusiasm should be infectious, but then you should challenge the student. You can't just transmit knowledge unidirectionally. Must respect the student. It's very important to have that balance of the two. And I, I think, again, this is something that I have to reflect on. At times we do, we do uh, show our disrespect, which is not acceptable. Patience, and that's very hard, of course. Some of us are still quite impatient, and you need to be patient when you trying to teach something to somebody else who has a different mental construct. You must be prepared for disappointments of all kinds. You may not get the gratitude. Must listen. Again, these are attributes that need to come all together, and it's not so easy. And the most important, I think, must not stand in the way of the student's learning. So there might be ways and other opportunities that the student has and that should be encouraged, even if you are not the facilitator of those opportunities. So this, to me, is a very nice list of 10, and this slide was given to me by Professor Kothari. So in medicine, I think this kind of teaching, the it's in many ways similar to what the Gurukula system existed in ancient India, where it's a very deep, involved, and intimate form of learning. So medicine is really a very much an art. All arts are best learned by the physical, in the physical presence of a master. So you take music, um, classical music, or any form of uh, very fine art, it needs to be, it cannot be learned remotely as well as it can be learned in the physical presence. The greatest learn lessons are learned in the spontaneity of the moment. And that's the reason why you need the physical presence. And of course, lots of fine tuning, corrections and iterations make, it's like, you know, honing a fine product and, and polishing a stone into a fine diamond. So the other thing is, of course, by watching the teacher, you the human virtues, which cannot be separated from your professional excellence. So this uh, quote again came from Dr. Kothari's slide collection, which says that education doesn't occur in a vacuum. Indeed, much of what is learned is outside the formal academic coursework, a hidden curriculum of observed behavior, interactions, and, and, and the culture of the training environment is a very powerful influence. And, and one of the things that you should do as a teacher is to build that culture within your environment and, and, and make the teaching environment such that there are so many ways that the students can learn. And this hidden curriculum is what you have to create outside of what is taught in classrooms. So this is the essence of how you learn in medicine. 
But what has changed in over time? In today's times, I think there's also there's a tendency to monetize. There's a tendency to give uh, monetary value to everything we do. We tend to measure everything in terms of money, particularly time. And the ease of access to information is, is, is actually a two-edged sword. I mean, it's very easy now to refer to facts. It's all accessible in today's digital age. But for some reason, I haven't seen that improve the knowledge base, the conceptual depth of the students. And I, I hold the view that it may be not necessarily always a good thing. The one thing it certainly does, the digital uh, age, is that it distracts us. And we've also become victims of that situation. Uh, I'm certain that our attention span, I can feel it. My ability to read, go through an entire book, uh, the way I used to do in the past is, is no longer the same because I too have distractions from digital distractions. Litigious case, uh, her healthcare environments have also contributed to some extent. We've become defensive, become conscious, become aware of the fact that uh, you can, you need to be conscious of these, uh, the fact that there may be situations during the training and teaching process that can expose you to litigation, especially when you try and mentor students into surgery or procedures. You, are, you have to be very, very careful. So that all that is, is part, the inescapable part of today's world. Uh, this quote I like very much from Dr. Kothari, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. And, and that's essentially the role of the teacher today. How, and how do you measure that? It's very hard to measure that. Um, in today's metrics, how do you measure what's an impact inspiring teacher? Not everything that can be counted counts, and this is something that is attributed to Albert Einstein, but it's very true and it's very important to understand this. Um, and, and therefore, it becomes very difficult to value something that's so intangible. Unfortunately, when you have a situation uh, like in India, where you, you have a shortfall of teachers, you have a short, a stretched regulatory system, and you have administration that's distracted, these intangibles get lost completely. They just don't get measured or identified. And therefore, we, part of this, part of the reasons, one of the many reasons why we've not been able to consistently value our teachers, we don't have robust systems of student feedback, mostly word of mouth, uh, it's great to have word of mouth, but then that doesn't help the teacher very much. Promotions and rewards are in serious disconnect with actual teaching skills. And that I think is almost universally true. And so those teachers who go the extra mile are just not rewarded. Teaching therefore amounts to a certain level of personal sacrifice. And so as a result, the greatest teachers are unheralded, unrecognized and unrewarded. I can say that. I can count so many extraordinary teachers who just are unknown. So career advancements are dictated by just counting publications in a very superficial way. Mere seniority, you just have to get older and you get promoted. And that's particularly true in many Indian institutions. And some, in, in some places, your contacts, your networking skills, your proximity to political to those in power, all that seems to count. So we have really an unfortunate situation. I mean, if you take the BC Roy Award, which is the award which is given to the greatest, uh, to the doctor, one doctor every year, and often one of the things that the, the BC Roy implies is that the doctor has to be a great teacher. But if you ask, look at the criteria that are asked for, you realize, and the process, if you look at the process, you really cannot pick the good teachers from this. And, and, and actually, if a few good teachers get them, that's pretty much by accident. But the greatest teachers will not do what is necessary to get this award. So I'm sure that there is a better, better framework in the West. And I'm not going to try and talk about it because I have no no locus, I don't have the understanding and I, I don't want to talk about it. 
uh, I'm sure that there is a structured student feedback on clinical teachers. I was, when I, in my training years, I did witness that happen and how it was, I saw how it was being collected, collated and compiled to some extent. Although I, I really have to say that it wasn't as intense as I thought it should have been. Um, then how much of weightage is actually given to teaching skills in promotions? Uh, it probably varies from institution to institution, but there is perhaps some value attached to your uh, teaching. And how does that translate into career advancements, promotions? How do you give best teacher awards? And how do you recognize teachers, people like Stan Perry, whose value you feel many, many years later? So these are things that, that the Western framework, uh, I'm sure, seeks to address. But I'm not familiar with it, so I won't, won't want to talk about it. What I talk about applies to India, and I'm pretty certain applies to a large number of low middle income countries and many other countries. Some fundamental challenges when we try to look at the situation in the Indian context is, is the questions that, we, that I'm asking are, are, are daunting. How, many, how are we going to mass produce doctors in the face of a system that doesn't value teachers? We've already, and I've seen this, a, a rapid, serious deterioration of clinical standards. A declining, most serious decline has been in decline of curiosity. My students don't ask enough questions. And I'm very frustrated by that. The, the whole decline in curiosity is something that's very striking. There's, of course, a deterioration in clinical skills with every generation, but that's maybe a bit of an overstatement. I may not be all that much of a problem, but I think the first problem is pretty serious. And of course, there is an increasing dependence on lab investigations without that fine-tuned judgment that, that, that should accompany uh, data analysis. So the, this is really the core of the crisis of medical modern medicine, and we have to stem the rot. So what we need today is a national awakening, a national debate. And the question that I think I would li like to ask is how should we develop, nurture, and value teachers of medicine? And I think we need to discuss this in multiple forums, in societies, in a, in a variety of uh, uh, situations where we have to bring this up. And we really also have to bring in a system a very good system, very robust system of student feedback, which has to be thoughtfully designed, has to be contextually appropriate. And we have to have these questionnaires and, and ask these questions, which, uh, which forces the student to answer with some level of honesty. What have I learned from this teacher? Is he, is he capable that he or she become my role model? Have that, has the teacher helped me become a better doctor, a better clinician? What are the qualities I'd like to emulate? And, and what are the various domains that, and skills that I think that the teacher offers something extra. How strongly would I recommend this teacher to my peers? So these are some, some of the questions, and I'm sure that the final questionnaire can be made through some collective efforts, and it can be very, very powerful in, in the way it can actually test uh, the value of a teacher. Of course, I can, I can have to tell you that questionnaire is not going to finally test everything, but that's just one way we have to do it. It's also important to recognize that we don't teach our teachers how to teach. And, and formal training in pedagogy in medical teachers is probably, come, it's needed. And, and I think everybody needs to go through it in one form or the other. And, and I think we also have to integrate teachers, uh, research with teaching. I think we've kept them separate and that doesn't work because all in clinical medicine, I think in clinical research is intimately related to clinical teaching. So that needs to be done. And of course, as we move on to the next uh, few 50, 100 years, we have to realize that there are many changes that have happened in medicine. And I think we need to look at patient-centered care. It's different from, uh, it's far more uh, uh, important these days. We have to partner with a variety of caregivers. And I think the ability to work as a team is very important. Something that wasn't part of traditional medical teaching, quality improvement is, is incredibly important in various environments information and communication and use of technology, having a, uh, looking at your diseases, your speciality through a public health lens, something very, very essential as we, we move towards the next several years. And as teach, senior teachers, we should not just impose our values and perceptions on the next generation. We need to come together and, not, and discuss positively, not just lament about the fact that our students are bad. We should start by recognizing the fact that the times are changing and there is 
somehow we have to bridge that disconnect that we have from the next generation of students to understand their perceptions, their aspirations and frustrations. And I think we have to implement a student evaluation framework. We have to link faculty promotion, at least in part, to that results. And then we have to link university ratings. And all this is happening on paper, but I don't think it is really, it's mostly a formality still. It's not implemented in the right spirit. And we have to advocate amongst our peers, amongst medical students, societies, universities, regulatory agencies, government, all this needs to be done to try and change the system and find a way to value our teachers. We need to have awards and rewards, has to be there. Otherwise, you don't come to know of great teachers. And this has to be a systematic process, not the arbitrary whims of a poorly constituted selection council that generally is the case. There has to be rewards at all levels. The best senior resident, for instance, the best. I learned so much from my senior residents. And it has to be across multiple specialties. Finally, I'd have to say that medical teachers are most critical to ensuring the quality of next generation of clinicians. And our fail failure to value good teachers is perhaps at the core of crisis of modern medicine. And we need collected efforts and sustained advocacy to address this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Krishna Kumar. Excellent way of presenting regarding the role model educators in our medical field. I still remember when I want to become a surgeon, I never got any positive response from the team. So I, my professor, pediatric professor, I still remember. He is the one who put me through in this field. Anyway, thanks a lot, Krishna Kumar. We go to next speaker, Dr. Kanwaljit S. Anand, currently the professor of pediatrics, Stanford University School of Medicine, Palo Alto, California, USA. A pillar and chief organizer of this conference, he shall be virtually presenting on topic, a comparison of external credentialing versus internal audits for quality improvement. I welcome Dr. Anand. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And uh, the topic uh, that has given to me, external credentialing versus internal audits for quality improvement, I hope to shed some light on the science of quality improvement and what are the tools available. Um, and if we are to, um, you know, climb Mount Everest, we would need a certain type of uh, equipment and tools. But uh, in every healthcare situation and in every medical college, uh, we are trying to climb Mount Excellence. And so what are the tools we will need for this journey? Um, I take my inspiration from Bhagwan Sri Satyasai Baba and his uh, uh, tremendous uh, 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 boon to us uh, by launching the Divine Medical Mission. This is back in the 1950s when the General Hospital was first built. And uh, in 84, this is what the General Hospital looked like. And I worked at this hospital in the outpatient clinic uh, for uh, uh, several weeks at a time. And then finally, in 1991, um, uh, the, uh, the what's called the Super Specialty Hospital or the Sri Satyasai Institute for Higher Medical Sciences was built. And in the beginning, um, you know, what Swami did was he, uh, the, the hospital was not very busy. So what he asked everybody to do is to perform the surgeries, to do, uh, take care of patients, go the, to the OPD, etc. And then he would ask everyone to stop. Uh, and for a couple of days, every team was supposed to sit down and think about what they had done, how they could improve. And, and that self-reflection and that um, uh, uh, immense uh, 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 degree of focus on improvement was what led to the greatness uh, of his institutions have achieved since then. With regard to quality science, um, a, a lot of the credit for that goes back to this one person, Dr. Abedis Dunabadian. 
1966, he published this paper, Evaluating the Quality of Medical Care. And he says, you know, this is just an attempt to describe current methods for assessing quality and suggests directions for further study. Um, and this um, really set the, the tone for the quality improvement work that has been done over the last uh, 50, 60 years. He gave us the six pillars of quality healthcare, safety first, timely care, equitable, effective, efficient care, which is patient-centered. And he also gave a framework. Uh, I'm copying this directly from his paper, uh, 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 from a paper talking about his uh, early work, which says that, you know, it gave us the three dimension, the structure or the context within the healthcare setting, um, the process, what is being done, and the outcomes. How do the patients do? after these healthcare interventions. And this has set the theme for how this whole field of quality improvement has developed. So why is quality so important? You know, it's basically, suppose you are making a choice and you make a choice that is just 1% better or 1% worse, you know, it doesn't impact you initially very much. Suppose you're, you're setting up a new hospital and you just take a 1% better uh, choice. No, 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 this will improve things just slightly. Over time, when those little choices add up, uh, you know, a completely different trajectory develops. Uh, and, and over time, if you take a choice that is 1% worse, um, uh, you know, it'll just take you in a very different direction. And that's why uh, quality improvement always seeks to ask, how can we improve? You know, it's proactive and dynamic instead of being reactive to some error or some mistake. It avoids any blaming any individual, supports the system to change, and focuses on the entire process, you know, instead of just one incident. And obviously, quality improvement has led to, you know, a number of quality systems that are currently in place. Uh, this is in, in hospitals, in clinics, uh, in birthing centers, surgical centers, and even in medical schools. That is uh, improving quality, improving the process, improving performance, um, and looking at organizational change through self-reflection and through data ana analytics. You know, how do you feel about the work that you're doing? You know, does it leave you with a sense of satisfaction and, and having done meaningful, uh, given the best of yourself uh, to this work? Uh, that is what equality is all about. Um, we'll come back to Donna Badian um, uh, at the end, but uh, one of the things that came out from his work were some of the methods for quality improvement. Uh, managing to do continuous PDSA cycles, which is plan, do, study, and act. You know, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, effort and thoughtfulness put on uh, lean thinking. The lean approach is the least wasteful method for providing, you know, the, the six pillars of quality that we talked about. And that is what a, a measurement-based strategy called Six Sigma is also based on. Um, uh, operates by examining the existing processes, creating new processes that can, um, you know, improve uh, the the overall outcome of the product. Uh, and this was first popularized by Toyota's Kaizen practices. So in in the hospital, you know, we should be very clear. We work for the patient. We focus on whatever the problems the patient is uh, facing. We remove variation. You know, all of us are, are, uh, have our own idiosyncrasies, our own styles, uh, but that clinical variability brings about um, a poorer outcome, um, you know, for the patients. We want to remove bottlenecks, communicate clearly, train the team, be flexible and be responsive. Um, you know, as the conditions change. And so uh, this is just the structure of a PDSA cycle. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, and I will not go over all of it in detail. 
But first thing is to plan. What will happen if we change this? We think this is, so how do, how do we predict the improvement and plan that who, when, how, where, et cetera? And then we go ahead and try it. And then we come back and see, oh, does it work? When we planned it, we said, okay, we'll do this for two months or three months, and then we'll come back and study it. And then, um, you know, once it is done, uh, yes, it's working, it's part of the system. How else can we improve? What's the next step? Um, and each of this, at each of these steps, we look at the structure, the context of the care from Donna Badian, the process, it could be leadership, management, interactions, diagnosis, therapy, a number of things. And then we look at outcomes that may be clinical or functional um, or experience or engagement related outcomes. So these are the kinds of things that we tend to study. Recognize that there's no financial in it, although uh, as quality improvement is launched and becomes a part of an institution, the, the financial uh, aspect becomes very clear. There are a number of other quality tools right now. Um, most important is communication, communication, communication. A communication to the power XXX. Um, uh, we have in our hospital local improvement teams, you know, small teams of people who are doing this one thing. They need to get together and say, okay, how can we improve, you know? Every morning um, uh, in the unit where I work, we have a daily team huddle where everyone, doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, uh, uh, the unit secretaries, the, the chaplain, the, you know, the IT people, everyone comes together. And we talk about, you know, what, are, what is the, the plan for the day and, and what are the challenges and how do, can we come together? How can we do better than what we did yesterday? Um, when a child comes from the uh, operation um, theater, you know, there's a multidisciplinary handoff. There's the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, you know, the nurses, the, uh, everybody, the OR staff and the ICU staff is all together. And we do this handoff, which has a very clear structure. Um, if something goes wrong, we do a root cause analysis, not to blame any one per, uh, person or any particular uh, team, but to see, how can we change the system? You know, there is peer review, the learning from system errors, but we've also now started learning from successes. When things go very well, the outcome is unexpectedly good. Then we go back and look, okay, how did we, how do we get to this? Uh, what is it that we did that went so well over here and can we replicate that, you know? And many a time, if there are, um, for example, there's a child coming in, in cardiac arrest who needs to go on ECMO. Uh, before the helicopter lands on the, uh, the roof, we have a just-in-time simulation. Like right there, 10 minutes before the, uh, the uh, patient comes, we do a simulation and see, okay, this is how the team will function. This is how the coordination will happen. And, and uh, I find that everything goes smoothly. There are many other tools uh, that are, are uh, available over there. Um, like I mentioned, uh, there is what's called the HQCAL or the Healthcare Quality Calculator. This simply shows the administration, you know, what's the financial impact. Uh, you can, you, there's a web-based version and you can search for this and you can put in your own, own data. Like this is one example, you know, where uh, there was um, uh, airway complications in surgical patients. And so this was before the in intervention, patients who had the complication, uh, uh, sorry, who had the, the controls did not have or had the complication. And then after 10 airway uh, uh, complications were prevented, they did this analysis again, and they found that there was you know, a certain, certain attributable cost per case uh, if you avoid uh, those complications. There are many other tools being taught um, uh, since this is a conference on education. Um, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, the European countries have gotten together and they have made these uh, easily available uh, open source uh, tools. There are four courses that different uh, people in healthcare system can go through uh, and they provide the improvement science education. 
and you can just answer some questions at the end of those modules and get accreditation. Um, there's also a great push um, since the last 10, 12 years of uh, using graduate medical education as the driver for quality improvement and, and safety. Uh, and this is an initiative of the independent academic medical centers, um, so which has now become a national movement. Um, uh, with the with the opening of DNB courses, uh, you know, at our hospital and in other Sanjeevni hospitals, I think this is something really important to look at. So let us talk about internal and external audits. You know, internal audit is where people come together and look at their own processes. The goal is mainly self-discovery, self-improvement. We, we are, are coming up with accountability from within uh, because none of us wants to make an error. None of us wants to um, you know, make a mistake or, or have something go uh, less than the best that we provide. Uh, it also gives an opportunity to recognize people who are, who are doing the best practices and it uh, gives us a preparation for any future challenges. Usually these uh, internal audits are every three to six months, uh, but also it's important to do an internal audit before you get you know, any credentialing visit or things like that. Uh, various examples are given over here uh, to look at quality systems evaluation, like credentialing, risk management, clinical policy and procedure evaluations, uh, regular review of the clinical data and benchmarking your data against similar institutions, you know, reviewing patient records, uh, particularly high-risk populations, uh, and reviewing for compliance with uh, various regulations and policies and contracts. Um, so uh, the, the problem with internal audits is sometimes pe people may not take it seriously. Uh, there is a risk of complacence or lack of attention to detail. And many hospitals have an internal audit uh, team that goes around. They get one or two champions from each unit, and then they perform the internal audit from there. And it's much, much important to uh, you know, ensure it's relevant, it's consistent and accurate every time an internal audit is performed. Um, what about external audits? You know, um, this is uh, basically a systematic review of all the publications on external audits. And I just summarized this over here. Um, the impact of the external audit is that it creates an awareness about quality improvement, uh, but this awareness, you know, uh, decreases over time. That's been studied and felt. Um, why is there an external? It's usually the healthcare staff that triggers the engagement with the audit. Um, you know, so uh, there, if people are feeling that, oh, these, this particular bad event or or this particular you know rare event is becoming more common, then that's what triggers. Uh, there is a change that is felt from you know from literally from the gut. Um, it's important to have champions, um, you know, and to um, uh, for this order to be perceived as worth the effort because you have to take time off from the work that you're doing. Um, and that's why, you know, uh, the bottom up driven audits have sustained uh, effects for a long time. Um, <clears throat> if there is a knowledge sharing with the external auditor, this triggers a lot of participation from the staff uh, and, you know, they, they can use the results of the audit to raise important issues if they need resources from their hospital leaders and things like that. Uh, it also legitimizes the feedback to the staff. It flattens any hierarchy within the system and allows constructive collaboration to happen. So um, uh, this is really important for the continuing professional development of all uh, people on the healthcare team. Moving on to uh, the process of medical school accreditation. You know, it's hard to understand uh, unless uh, you've launched a medical school, what, what is accreditation? Uh, this is basically a designated authority within a country or within the world 
that reviews and evaluates um, the educational institution against clearly defined set of standards, you know. So before you get accreditation, every college or uh, uh, every uh, institute will go through a collegial process of self-review and peer review for improvement. Um, uh, and this is all quality improvement and public accountability. So this is based on Council of Higher Education accreditation. Um, so uh, why do we need a medical school accreditation? We know um, uh, it will have, it will trigger a self-assessment. It will, uh, uh, you know, generate interest to take an honest um, uh, look at ourselves and how good are we. Uh, it will also, um, you know, uh, require an external review by an external body, like a national body. Um, but it ensures public accountability for the work that is going to be done. Uh, in terms of creating doctors, cre cre creating clinicians of the future. Uh, but most important is that it is a tool for quality improvement. It helps to improve the quality of each academic program and each process within the medical school. Um, we know that there are many new medical schools that are coming up, not only in India, but all over the world. And each of these, you know, there is a huge variability in the quality of the education. Why? Because they have variable infrastructure. Uh, there is a lack of sufficient faculty members. Uh, we heard from one of the speakers that, you know, all of these new medical colleges are being built, but there is nobody to teach over there. There's a variability on what is the curriculum? What is the content and how is it delivered to the students? Is that really effective? Uh, are we really preparing, uh, you know, the best clinic professionals we can? Um, some of these uh, medical schools have variable numbers of patient populations. For example, in this part of the world, uh, you know, there are all these private medical schools in the Caribbean, but they don't have uh, patient hospitals, or, uh, patient populations or hospitals to treat them. So their medical students, after the preclinical, they come to mainland US and, and they have affiliations with various community hospitals or private hospitals. Um, so we've also seen the phenomenon of migration of students for a medical education uh, you know, into other countries uh, and migration of physicians who may come from other countries or go to other countries all of this um, uh, is, is uh, required uh, in order to, uh, uh, by having accreditation, you will have harmonized standards. You will be able to know what is the value, what is the, um, uh, the uh, quality of the education that has been imparted. And so it will promote universally accepted standards for evaluating either undergraduate or postgraduate medical education. Um, ultimately, it's all about the patients. It's all about, you know, how compassionate uh, a doctor are you? You know, what is the level of integrity? Um, patients want people who are well-trained, well-educated, uh, and, uh, you know, who have received a quality education, a quality clinical training, who have enough experience to be able to practice independently, and there is a transparency so that there is, uh, you know, uh, better education leads to better patient care. Uh, there is currently a, a push for the, um, uh, the various accreditation agencies across the world to get recognition from the World Federation for Medical Education. Um, and, uh, you know, once they have that, then there will be uh, a, a clear transparency that the minimum standards have been met. Uh, and many countries are signing up for, for this kind of uh, recognition program or evaluation uh, by an international body, uh, which has taken many of the experts from WHO. In the US, um, you know, there's the Liaison Committee on Medical Education. Uh, it is a body that is a, a subsidiary of the American Association um, uh, for, of Medical Colleges. And so this LCME is the one, uh, it's, 
it's not a government body. It's an independent body, which is um, uh, 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 appointed by the Association of uh, Medical Colleges. Uh, and it, it provides the standards for accreditation of medical education programs. And this has recently been pu published, uh, the standards and elements that are that will be effective, that will be applied as of July 2023, have just been released. Um, so um, in this, um, there is there are 12 standards. And like my uh, previous uh, uh, speaker, he talked about, you know, how is teaching evaluating, uh, teaching being evaluated? There is a standard for that, teaching, supervision, assessment, how are teachers and students being assessed? and then student and patient safety. But there's also, you know, all of these 12 standards cover the entire structure and function of the medical school. Uh, mission planning, leadership, uh, academic learning environments, faculty preparation, productivity, educational resources, competencies, etc. The curriculum, uh, uh, how the content and how it is managed and enhanced. Um, you know, what's the selection of students like uh, and their academic support, career advising, educational records. Um, and they, not only that, but also health services, physical and mental health, financial aid services, personal counseling, all of these that are clearly defined standards. Um, so I will conclude at this point uh, that quality improvement is very important for all healthcare activities. It's important to have an interdisciplinary, evidence-informed and systems-based approach. We need to learn from all our successes and errors, near misses and failures. Um, uh, in, the, in the ultimate analysis, there's no uh, this versus that. Internal and external audits are both important. And I think the, the focus should be on being good rather than looking good. I find some of the institutions, particularly uh, you know, uh, when there is a JCAHO a Joint Commission uh, um, inspection happening, you know, they they uh, do a kind of a whitewash uh, and and they want to look good. Uh, it reminds me of a, a Doha from uh, uh, Kabirji. He said, "Bhek bhav baho antara, jaise dhart akas, ek preet govind ki." Ek jagat ki as. So meaning uh, there are huge other differences between a true and a show of devotee, um, as much as between the earth and the sky. One of them, the one uh, is a true devotee is drowning in, in the love of God, uh, whereas the other thinks about who's watching my devotion. Um, so there's a huge difference between and then ultimately, I think it just depends on the intensity of your love. You know, how much do you love what you're doing? All the com compassion and empathy and excellence and quality are just expressions of love. This is my, my humble opinion after being in practice for 40 years. Um, this op-ed was published recently by some of the uh, very well-known scientists of uh, um, uh, the quality science, Donald Burbick uh, for the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, Daniel Fox, um, you know, and they said evaluating quality of medical care. This was the classic article 50 years later. Uh, this was published, I think, in 2006. And in that, they quote Don Abadian. He says, the secret of quality is love. You have to love your patient. You have to love your profession. You have to love your God. Um, so here is uh, the essence of quality is, is exactly what uh, Bhagwan Sri Satya Sai Baba has uh, inspired us with to love all and serve all. And also Sri uh, uh, Sadhguru Sri Madhusudan Sai has uh, compelled us or, or given us the opportunity to put those learnings, uh, those teachings into action. Um, and that's why a few years ago, um, I, I had written this commentary called Love, Pain and Intensive Care. And in that, uh, uh, this was published in the Journal of Pediatrics about 14 years ago. Uh, and in that, the beginning of this article is, uh, is a quote from Swami. 
uh, where Swami says, no activity can give you the joy that service does. You should yearn for the chance to console, comfort, encourage, heal. See yourself as another. Feel his joy to be yours, his sorrow to be yours. And with that, I will close. Um, thank you very much for this uh, uh, important opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Anand. Uh, it's a very nice uh, explanation about quality improvement. As we have short of time, uh, let's proceed to next uh, uh, <clears throat> next delegate, Dr. Pratap, Registrar of Academics and Professor and Head of the Department of Microbiology, MS Ramaya Medical College, Bangalore, India. He will present how to evaluate the social impact, human values, working environment, and student integral health in medical colleges and teaching hospitals. Uh, over to you, Dr. Pr A very good morning to all of you, and thank you for having given me this opportunity to present my thoughts before you. And uh, talking about uh, quality, uh, all of us, uh, I will take it from uh, a simple uh, <coughs> analysis of what it could be, and then take on the uh, topic for discussion today. Uh, generally, when we talk in terms of quality, uh, we, our thought process is, uh, is it the best what I can do? to the maximum capacity of whatever I am capable of doing is what we probably think in terms of quality. So am I doing good today? Can I do better tomorrow? Can I compare in terms of what is best today or in the present? The reason that I am using the word today or present is what is relevant or what is considered best today may change tomorrow and what was best yesterday may not be relevant today, or there could be scope for further improvement. With this in mind, let me talk in terms of how you can talk in terms of quality, how to evaluate the social impact, human values, working environment, and student integral health in medical colleges and teaching hospitals in today's context. So what I will be doing is talk in terms of what these are, and talk in terms of whether there is an existing framework and as is the thought process, there is definitely a process of continual quality improvement as we know that quality cannot be absolute and keeps changing with times. So what is the social impact? So presence of medical schools do have a positive influence on the public health profile. For example, if we look at our country, we know that with the, rest, the number of medical colleges or medical schools are comparatively less in the northeastern areas. Whereas, for example, in Puducherry, you can say that the number of medical colleges are more. So has it made a difference if we look at the health indicators or key framework indicators related to health in that particular area? Does, has it made a difference? So whenever we talk in terms of medical colleges, there are three things that we talk in terms of. One is delivery of medical education, which deals with supply of high quality healthcare professionals and the provision of mentored training with respect to medical education. When we talk in terms of patient care, there is availability of expertise, scope for improving or adding on subspecialities and for, there is always a scope for further exp expansion. When we uh, started medical education, basically undergraduate medical education, postgraduate medical education in the form of broad specialities, and then super specialities, and it is ever increasing with respect to the expansion of these facilities whenever we talk in terms of medical training. And when we talk in terms of research and extension activities, there is a need-based uh, concept to look at improved outcomes in terms of healthcare delivery and how from a hospital-based setup, you move into the community-based aspects of improving the healthcare systems and delivery. So the teaching approach basically is oriented towards training of 
students or physicians of first contact who are capable of looking after the preventive, promotive, curative, and the addition with the new curriculum which has come up in 2019 talks in terms of palliative and holistic care with compassion. With compassion, again, they come in terms of another module with this, which is called as Attitude, Ethics and Communication module or the ATCOM module. And just as I mentioned a little earlier, it is moved from a health systems or a hospital-based training to community-based approach, which is emphasized now with the current curriculum. So are there measures taken to look at the quality framework when it comes to social impact? Yes. So with respect to curricular aspects, we talk in terms of curricular design and development, where we talk in term terms of the need-based inputs, planning relevant programs in tune with emerging national needs, and also taking into consideration global trends, and there are efforts to revise and update. The scope for me to discuss all aspects may not be there within the framework of the time provided to me, so I will just give you examples. So with respect to curricular design and development, now we talk in terms of not mere revisions, but the scope for including interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary aspects into the curriculum. So there is scope, for example, morning with when we heard the speakers talking in terms of integrated medicine, I know that there is a restriction with respect to time, but few sensitization aspects have been taken into the curriculum. For example, the current program talks in terms of the, uh, you know, the rotatory internship of 12 months now has one week of Ayurveda or any other systems of medicine. So there is an introduction to the alternative forms of medicine during the in the current approach. So there is already scope for revision. So previously when we were talking in terms of uh, integration, we used to talk in terms of horizontal integration and vertical integration. Now that has been taken care of. In addition to that, you know, there is scope for electives. So the undergraduate student will still be exposed to super speciality during the initial training phase of the M within the MBBS framework. So there is some amount of change, some amount of revision which has happened with respect to curricular design and development and similarly with respect to curricular planning and implementation when we talk in terms of CBME competency based medical education which has been introduced in 2019 there is a shift from mere exposure to lectures which used to happen majority of our training sessions used to be lecture sessions so now there is scope for self-directed learning there is scope for interactions small group discussions and so on within the framework of undergraduate medical education so curricular planning and implementation with respect to operational efforts and the framework depending on the resource potential and the institutional goals. Now why do I say in terms of resource potential? We have to talk in terms of three things. Infrastructure, availability of manpower, processes and outcomes which have already been mentioned. So you'll have to work within this framework with what is available to look at what are the outcomes. Obviously. Whenever we talk in terms of outcomes, we have to measure or map the outcomes to look at what we have achieved and what can be achieved or what is to be improved. So here with respect to academic flexibility, with respect to time frame options, mobility, inter, -trans, inter or transdisciplinary approach and supplementary enrichment, I have already put, you know, put in a word with respect to how there are options for with respect to time framework within the uh, existing uh, syllabus already though we have uh, four and a half years plus one year as the uh, thing uh, you know total framework uh, in terms of time within the available time frame options we are looking at how we can increase inter or transdisciplinary for example let me make it very but it depends on what availability you have within your institution for example we talk in terms of nutrition when it comes to training in biochemistry but has the undergraduate being exposed to looking or looking at, uh, at the preparation what actually happens and can they work out a diet sheet. So in case you have a hotel management uh, you know, uh, discipline within your institution, you can actually ask them to work out a diet plan. 
for somebody who is normal, for somebody who has hypertension and so on. Like Madam just mentioned, in Siddha they say, okay, uneve marund. So you talk in terms of diet and that as a, pro, you know, as the medicine for well-being of a patient. So there are uh, various concepts, there are lots of concepts. One of the things that uh, we can probably incorporate is to see how much we can incorporate within a definite time framework. Because one of the major constraints is time. You know, like you can go on increasing from four and a half plus one year to so on, to plus another one year and so on. So, but the problem is we'll have to deliver within a fixed framework. So one of the challenges for all of us is to see how much we can in incorporate, how much we can blend, how much we can integrate as far as the training is concerned. I understand that training in medicine is a lifelong thing. So we, we, we always talk in terms of the uh, learner who has to be a clinician of first contact, a good communicator, which involves lifelong learning, the capability to work within a team uh, you know, framework and so on. But the problem here is we also have to remember that when you're delivering the medical curriculum in terms of teaching, learning and so on, you have a fixed framework and the medical graduate has to remember one thing, learning is lifelong, okay? So one of the things we'll have to talk in terms of is the next point with, re with respect to curricular enrichment. Is there scope for holistic development? Like somebody was mentioning in the morning, let me take all goods and not negate what is available to us in the form of advantage. So there is definite scope for value additions. For example, even in the uh, curriculum or in the accreditation process, we talk in terms of value additions and add-on courses. When we talk in terms of value additions, we put it as any course which is not there in your usual curriculum, more than 15 hours duration of training. So that is taken as a value addition and the curriculum gives you credit when you talk in terms of the accreditation process for curricular enrichment. So coming to the uh, teaching learning process, let me just uh, tell you a few, uh, give you a background before I go on and talk in terms of the quality. Just like uh, the previous speaker, Sir mentioned in terms of 12 criteria which are available for you for accreditation of the medical schools. Here also we have an accreditation framework which takes into consideration seven aspects. The first aspect is with respect to curriculum. Second aspect is with respect to teaching learning. Third aspect is with respect to research and extension activities. Fourth, ac fourth, fourth criteria deals with infrastructure and learning resources. Fifth aspect is with, is with respect to student support and progression. Sixth is with respect to governance and leadership. Seven is with respect to innovation and best practices. And you are also allowed to talk in terms of what your best practices. You can talk in terms of any two best practices that you have and also in terms of institutional distinctiveness. So there are seven uh, you know, criteria. And here again, the criteria are again subdivided into qualitative criteria and quantitative uh, criteria. So taking that into consideration, let me just talk in terms of the teaching learning processes which we would like to have. It has student-centric methods. You have a mentoring system with relevant infrastructure to measure outcomes, like teacher quality and profile. There is also scope for exchanging student or faculty exchange. Why are we doing this? Most of the times when we have internal uh, activities going on, we feel what we are doing is probably the best or we work towards improvement at the local level. But when this happens, either student exchange or faculty exchange, you can always look at what is good or better happening in another place to incorporate within your system. So quality systems also can be incorporated into the teaching facilities, like just like we spoke in terms of the facilities that can be, I mean, the quality systems, for example, or the accreditation process that exist within our set setup, either NABL, NABH, and so on, accreditation processes. So you, you similarly have accreditation pro uh, processes for education also. Extension activities with respect to what makes a social impact, you can talk in terms of how your com camps, health camps that you probably have conducted, collaborative activities either with government or non-government activities, and your institutional social responsible, uh, responsibility activities that you might, might have conducted and outcomes mapped to look at what impact you have made. Social accountability can be mapped in terms of say district or provincial level indicators. For example, the level of infectious disease or anemia or infant mortality rate or maternal mortality rate in your particular area, okay? Looking at pre, during your program and post activity uh, improvement that could have happened can measure your social impact. 
Talking in terms of human values, basically we talk in terms of five core human val values, truth, right conduct, peace, love, non-violence, tolerance, and so on. And again, today's morning speaker has touched on some of these aspects being covered as a part or principles of biomedical ethics, where we talk in terms of autonomy, which can be taken as sub-value of peace. This is the opportunity you give your patient to choose what he or she wants to do. Beneficence, sub-value of right conduct and love, non-maleficence, that is do no harm in terms of thought, word, or deed, and also justice, which is a sub-value of right action and love. So how is it incorporated here? I've already told in terms of ATCOM module, which talks in terms of clinician of first, first contact, learning to be a leader and a member of a healthcare team, capability to perform as a team member, a good communicator, lifelong learner, and the practice of professionalism, including ethical, responsible, and the most important part, accountability. So how is this imparted? in terms of service leading, uh, service learning, which can be meaningful community service, which enriches learning. Again, the terminology hidden curriculum. Most often, everything may not be taught. You know, we observe, we learn from what somebody is doing, and if somebody is doing it right, I think we should be imbibing that. So here comes the question of role modeling and experiential participation. And last part, professionalism is again a part of the curriculum as a part of training and also practice. So how is quality framework ensured in monitoring a few of these aspects? So inclusion of core human values in the curricula, teaching learning, learning process has a process for innovation. Whenever we talk in terms of domains of learning, we talk in terms of uh, cognitive or you know, knowledge, psychomotor or skill, and affective domain, or how one goes through the emotional component. So here you can have innovative methods in terms of teaching and learning. And here again, you have community or field practice which brings out human values in your student. You can also have something to guide, a code of conduct handbook or a committee which looks at continuous improvement in these areas. And celebration of national international days. And there are efforts to promote inclusiveness which is actually looked at as one of the criteria here. Working environment, I will again uh, just give you a gist of it. So infrastructure uh, and the physical facilities which are available, learning resources including library or in a healthcare system, it is the hospital which, you know, where your patient inflow towards adequate training is something that is going to determine the outcome. Nowadays you have the concept of skill labs with appropriate infrastructure and the training component available can actually add to it. Here the population talks in terms of qualified and trained manpower, faculty, that is students and trainings, both number and quality. And lastly, you talk in terms of support systems, student and faculty welfare, progress and recognition, and innovation ecosystem as such. So quality will actually check in terms of adequacy of these facilities, functioning, the exp expenditure for infrastructure development and augmentation and maintenance, which has actually happened here, the clinical resources which are available, and the library as a learning resource. Libraries have always been there. But nowadays what we'll have to look at is whether the physical libraries are actually utilized, what is the extent of utilization, and how it can actually go one step further and give in, I mean, uh, provide accessibility without even visiting the physical facility. With respect to the working environment, there are a lot of other things which actually add to, uh, you know, the um, comfort level or the learning environment, that is the student's diversity and support systems, presence of a council or a mentoring group. And we'll have also have to th think in terms of capability, and capability enhancement or development schemes. Like one of the things that was told is, you know, provide a learning environment which is going to be progressive to your student. There is certain thing, certain, there may be certain things that I may not know or I may not have wanted as a student. The today's students require those things. So one of the things that you'll have to uh, recognize is their uh, potential to probably learn more than what you would, you would have done. So that is another thing that you'll have to uh, you know, recognize and provide for the students of today. Career counseling and guidance towards their progress. Effective leadership and strategic planning in place. This puts in lot of policies in place which actually helps 
the students or the faculty or the systems within a particular organization to process and progress. Innovation ecosystems, one of the things that I just like to mention here is incubation center. This is something that was not there earlier in medical schools. Now it talks in terms of collaborating with other colleagues from other branches, including transdisciplinary within the system to come out with solutions for so many problems that might actually be there. Uh, many things have been talking in, uh, spoken in terms of internal quality assurance mechanisms in the previous talk, so I would not like to cover that particular aspect, but only mention that you know, continuous quality improvement is the key word for today. Student he integral health is something that I was wondering when I got this topic, uh, what do you mean by student in integral health? Then we realized that there are so many things that we might be doing, but we don't realize that as a part of the student integral health. I will just try to summarize by looking at three aspects. One is the physical well-being of the student. Next is about the mental well-being of the student. And what is puzzling is, do I have criteria to map spiritual well-being? Because there is something that you know we all have misconceptions about what is spiritual. It may not be uh, you know related to any particular religion or faith or what we practice, but could be related even with respect to how, how I look at a problem, how I look at environment, or how happy I am or what is the happiness quotient also could define my spiritual uh, well-being. So there are uh, tools which are available to look at your somatic, mental, and uh, spiritual health of uh, students. And as far as quality is concerned, the foundation course as a part of the CBME has actually incorporated aspects related to co-curricular and extracurricular to look at this particular aspect. So facilities towards sports or cultural or community-based trainings mentorship, gender equity programs. You also are looking at student support groups, feedback mechanisms, remedial measures. The concept of parent-teacher meetings have again cropped in here. Uh, there are lots of ifs and buts with respect to whether you need to incorporate that in adult education. But what happens at home is usually going to be, there has to be a connect between what actually ha happens in the uh, you know environment at home versus environment at work. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to just uh, summarize by saying uh, this is a quality framework which is available towards effective accreditation process which can be continually evolving process but in simple terms I would like to just end by looking at uh, this uh, practice that we already have as a part of our culture Mata, Pita, Guru and Daivam. So Pita mostly is expected to provide all the infrastructure or support that is required. Mata puts the processes in place, talks in terms of how to improve things, and does what is best for what is, whatever is happening in that particular environment. Guru obviously steps in as a guide to, as an external uh, resource uh, member. So as what was told, internal audit versus external audit. The Guru is a guide to look at the processes which needs to be improving and uh, we all believe in the uh, supernatural with respect to uh, God who also decides in terms of where we are moving. So if you combine a sum total of everything and we definitely look at aspects related to improving our quality of life, what happens at home and similarly we just need to look at or translate it, it, it into what happens in, at our workplace and finally what we have at home as what is best for us needs to be translated into what can be best for community at large. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Pradab. It's an excellent presentation. We learned a lot of things about evaluate this, all other environment factors, social impact, and all those things in medical, hospital, and colleges. Next, we'll, uh, we have Dr. Sneha Kulkarni, a Director of Pediatric Cardiology, Dr. Sri Satyasai Sanjeevani Hospital, Raipur, India. She will talk about stakeholders' feedback methods and their implementation to improve institutional quality and trust. Welcome, Dr. Kulkarni. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, the chairpersons. I thank Dr. Sunny Anand a lot uh, for involving me uh, in this interesting and uh, informative conference. I'll just uh, uh, try to incorporate some of my views uh, when I'm talking on this subject. Uh, 
I think lots, lots has uh, been talked about how to improve the quality in medical education, especially for the students. But the most important thing what I feel, which are the stakeholders, and how you uh, take this impact of the stakeholders when we try to impact the quality in medical education for the medical students, and how we can uh, uh, improve them. I realized that the clinicians, uh, we are working as a clinicians for the last 30 years, and many times we have learned many things just by practice or on my own, which were never incorporated in our education as a medical students. And I sometimes feel if those things would have been taught to me earlier, I think as a, no, it's okay. I think uh, I realized that I would have been a better doctor at the end. As a, in medical education, we know that continuous quality imp improvement is uh, required, is essential. In general, most of the medical schools are very conservative, very hierarchical. I'll, they're many times uh, disconnected from what happens to the reality. And when we go into the social fields, the challenges are continuously different. Even as a medical uh, clinicians, we also feel there is a lot of change which are required from these hierarchical uh, mechanisms. And from that aspect, uh, feel, uh, I feel a lot of stakeholders' views and perspectives are very important for us to improve as a doctors. We have to keep pace uh, with the advancing public demands that was uh, discussed uh, previously, that what the patients and the community needs from us and needs to be incorporated into our medical education. We need to incorporate certain things as far as the evidence-based medicine, increase attention to the effectiveness and efficacy. Because when multiple stakeholders are uh, involved into the medical students' educations, they ask us the questions, what is the fitness for the purpose? We have to educate them as a capable future physicians. As was discussed yesterday's conference, actually, that many of the stakeholders or many, uh, it's, it's a lot of money which is required to create a medical students. And whether it's really a value for money when we really create an effective medical student at the end. Everybody wants to have a perfect student, and we have to focus on zero defects at the end. Every organization wants to become exceptionally good organizations that we have to stand out. We, we heard a talk from Stanford. Everybody wants to be ourselves as compared to the Stanford uh, educational system. And definitely, it needs to have a transformative uh, educational program. We have to uh, have these educational standards which need to be incorporated. When we go as a doctors, actually we are just not experts in our clinical field. I'm not, I, I have been taught a lot like anatomy, physiology, pharmacology. But when I go as a doctor, there are multiple other challenges we, I face in the community. We deal with diversity of patients' population. Patient literacy, when I deal with a patient, yesterday was talked again, a completely Google-educated patients versus a completely illiterate patients. My challenge to explain them about their disease process and outcomes is completely different. There are different needs of different continent. Patients who come from uh, U uh, Western countries is different than a patient who come from our rural villages. Cost is always a major concern when we try to practice clinical medicines. We have 10 options available, but what option I can use in an effective way with a given possible cost actually is always a challenge for a doctor. There is a need for a multitasking. I'm a doctor, I'm a healer, I'm an educator. I, I have to do multiple things. Human resources to have an effective medical uh, uh, solution is always a constraint with us. We need to have a community-based approach which have been discussed, and we need to have a continuous process of innovating ourselves. And there is no common solution for all. In between, I listened to talk of, of uh, Swamiji, the prioritization of the research. He told that how to have a research which will give answers to an immediate question which is in front of you rather than having a, a kind of a imaginative problem which will come to us 20 years down the line. So prioritization of the research also is one of the important things. We need to have quality assurance in the system. We need to have uh, med uh, feedbacks on regular intervals and assessment methods. And when we have a, a medical education, there are different stakeholders which come into the process, and we need to take their opinions when we try to uh, have a quality assurance. The students, the alumni of the medical colleges, the most important is the patient, the government or administrators who have all the policies which are in place, the society, community in, uh, where we are going to treat uh, the patients, 
other medical professionals like the colleagues and the clinicians who are working with us and the teachers. So we need to have all the stakeholders' opinions when we decide to improve the quality in medical education. And I feel the most important stakeholder in creating medical education today is the medical student. It was discussed before also, and maybe uh, I feel personally when we work as teachers, we give very less time for the pair with the students. Maybe we are multitasking and there is no much time really given for the pay, uh, students to give the quality care uh, uh, education. And we need to uh, spend much more time with the interaction with the students, have a commitment from the faculty. A student interest, uh, teacher interaction is a must. Many times we assume that the students know certain things, but in reality, we realize that they don't know many things. And therefore, and there is a big gap between the teachers and the students, and uh, we need to give more time for uh, them to understand their problems, the way we need to communicate to them. And this medical student is a really a key uh, 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 stakeholder in this uh, situation. It was discussed again before that uh, the public care are uh, uh, the major stakeholder again in the one is one end is a student, the other end is the patients where we teach, the, uh, where we treat these patients. And there are a lot of actually reports or a lot of projects which have been done. What are the experiences and expectations of patients and public involvement in healthcare systems? They always, the public always wants that the students or the doctors which treat them needs to be well trained will need to be well educated, can understand their needs, and really give effective medical care. And uh, they need to have even uh, their feed, uh, the stakeholders' opinion as far as how a student is selected, how he is accepted as a medical student. And uh, we have to uh, understand that our theory needs to actually translate into the practice to treat them. And therefore, a lot of models have been developed how a patient and a, uh, public involvement in the medicine should be there to have a good medical student at the end. And there are multiple ways uh, how we can involve them. What is called as a ladder of involvement to measure the impact and depth of uh, public, private, inter public and patients' uh, uh, integration into the education. Develop the communication uh, skills, how to motivate the students to take care of these uh, patients at the end. Demonstrate the most important is relevance of learning. I learned something, but it has to be relevance, uh, relevant when we treat the patients at the end. So uh, as I said, there are multiple models. There are group discussions. The patients' interviews uh, uh, needs to be taken. Maybe there are a uh, uh, lot of uh, problems when we try to inter uh, have this system in place. We need to have resource support how the patient's needs and roles to be incorporated into the educational system, how the programs need to be managed, and there can be gaps as far as the ethical issues are concerned, how to uh, assess the impact of long and short term outcomes, and uh, these are some of the issues uh, we need to take into consideration. And various topics uh, can be involved uh, in the whole educational system how the storytelling or history taking it can be helped as far as the curriculum designing is concerned. The methodology can be how to understand these expectations from the patients and the patients group. It can be a individual interviews, it can be a group interviews as a focus groups, and we have to create even advocacy groups about, amongst the patient populations. How to implement this my model in the medical education system, I think is a big task with us and uh, how to get a resource support, again, a time constraint, the faculty involvement into the whole system also need to be looked into. Another thing which I feel as a doctors, we never learn this how to develop the leaders who can develop this uh, healthcare challenges. So knowing the subject is one thing, but implementing the healthcare into the population is another thing, and actually that requires a leadership quality. We do have short or shortage of professionals, we, as we saw in the uh, COVID times, that there are changing pattern of the diseases, and we really, we were really confused in the beginning that how to take care or how to address these issues in the beginning. There is a high demand from the services. Again, always uh, there is a challenge in dealing the cost of the medical care. If you go into the rural places, there is a poor accessibility. We do not have a national informative system in place completely. 
and we still are learning to take the electronic uh, media to uh, take care of healthcare system. And therefore, uh, when we have to deliver the effective medical uh, care, I think the leadership roles are very important. And I, I feel personally we may have to take the help of other organizations to include, uh, implement these leadership roles into the uh, medical care system. And again, how it can be done, there are uh, multiple things about the improving the communication skills, conflict resolutions, appropriate uh, attitude. We many times deal with a lot of uh, problems where not only one person is required, but that the whole uh, problem requires a multiple specialty involvement to take care of a particular issue. And therefore, there has to be one leader to coordinate between the other systems. And therefore, this ladder model will be very important. Again, we have to uh, face with the human resources. We may have to collaborate with other organizations like um, management schools and design the programs. And we have to connect it with the clinical contest. There are different teaching methods and there can be assessment methods how we implement the systems while teaching the students. It was talked about uh, competency-based medical education, how it, because at the end we need to have a competent doctors and they need to be focused on outcomes and learners achievements. We require multifaceted achievement when we have to uh, implement this competency-based medical education into the system. We have to support a flexible, time-independent uh, method. We need to create a, a very increased accountability to the stakeholders. Again, a common knowledge of the education and assessment system need to be involved uh, into the whole thing. There are, again, concerns and challenges as far as the administering this kind of a programs into the system, faculty development. We do not have an ideal model where we can look into need to have a flexible curriculum and the time which need to be incorporated into the education system. This is one of the thing I feel we lack quite a lot. We do not have communication skills as doctors, which I see from myself and many of my colleagues, because we learn it over the period of time which has never been implemented into the system. And the most important thing I realize when we deal with an adverse outcome or any complication which happen in the medical fields very often, and the only way where a doctor can be bailed out, or we are in a safe situation, what I feel, when we keep the communication channels open to the patients and their relatives. If we stop that communication, and we see a lot of things happening that the patients throw uh, or uh, make a lot of agitations against the hospital when some adverse events happens. And that's mainly or only because we do not have any communication between the us and the patient families. And they do not know what is happening. And we have to keep these communication channels open, especially when we are dealing with our adverse events. Again, interdisciplinary communications between us and the other discipline also is very important when we uh, work as effective doctors into the uh, community. The second thing which I uh, feel which is one of the important thing when we graduate from uh, or uh, in the process of uh, going into specialities and super specialities, how we transition from a, a, a undergraduate to a postgraduate uh, students because there are no channels how we can, we again assume many things that they know that they're going into this kind of specialities. And we need to give a time to the students who are going to be postgraduate students and the faculty to see how the transition can happen very effectively. So there are concerns when we uh, deal with uh, patients with long hours. The, uh, it has been talked about the physical and mental uh, health issues. We deal with enhanced beauty hours. We deal with modified call hours. And we, there needs to be a lot of personal coping mechanism when we deal with adverse kind of a situation. And I think we are never taught. We just learn over the period of time. And therefore, it's very important to have a stakeholder feedbacks into the medical curriculum at the end to create a good medical student and a good medical doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kukarni. It was an excellent presentation, how to take feedback and implementation for the sake of, uh, you know, institution quality and trust. Thanks again. Uh, we'll come to the summary uh, by Dr. Um, Bharat, thank you. Sorry, Ram. A big thanks to all the speakers for their uh, well-designed talks and uh, addressing the objectives of the session. 
In the first session, Professor Krishna Kumar spoke about career advancement for faculty who serve as role model educators for medical students. He stressed the importance of pr presence of physical uh, presence of the teacher, and he pointed out the changes that have happened in the medical field over times, such as a uh, tendency to mod monetize everything, ease of access to information, and the distracted minds of the current generation, and the litigious current uh, healthcare environments. He also pointed out the impact of our failure to value great teachers and the problems with the current Indian situation. According to Professor Krishna Kumar, discussion in multiple forums promoting societies of specialities and amongst senior teachers and a robust student feedback mechanism is the way forward. In the next talk, Professor Kanvajit Anand spoke about comparison of external credentials versus internal audits. Plan, do, study, act, cycle implementation, establishing local imp improvement teams, multidisciplinary handoffs, root cause analysis, peer review committees, and learning from both successes and errors are effective ways of internal assessment of improvement. Internal audit, however, runs a risk of complacency. So external audits omits a hierarchy, legitimate, uh, legitimizes feedback, and ensures public accountability. Ultimately, both the internal and external audits aim at ensuring a patient-centric healthcare system. Next, Professor Pratap sir spoke about evaluation of social impact, human values, working environment, and student integral health in medical colleges. Evaluation of extension activities of medical colleges, research activities, grants, publications, are all indicators of social impact by established medical colleges, as described by sir. The ATCOM model, service learning, promoting professionalism as part of training, enforcing a code of conduct, and e efforts to improve inclusiveness are all ways to inculcate and evaluate human values in medical colleges. Promoting student diversity, developing support councils, career counseling and guidance, and developing innovation ecosystems are methods pointed out by Professor Pratap in evaluation of work environment. Incorpor incorporating foundation course as a part of the curriculum, promoting physical facilities, community-based training, establishing feedback mechanisms, frequent evaluation of reforms in the midterm mid curriculum, and promoting scholarships and fee waivers are methods to evaluate student integral health. Lastly, Dr. Snehal Ma'am spoke about uh, stakeholder feedback methods and their implementation to improve inter inter institutional quality and trust. Students, alumni, patients, administrators, society, medical professionals, and teachers are all key stakeholders in medical education. Interview of focused groups, semi-structured interviews, and patient and public partnerships are the key feedback methods, as told by ma'am. Resource, resource support, faculty commitment, and cost and sustainability are all key problems of implementation. Implementing leadership programs in the curriculum, assessing and developing emotional intelligence, and communication skills and team building are the key points. She also stressed the importance to optimize communication skills and the need for smoother transition from undergraduates to postgraduates. So with these points, I would like to uh, thank the four excellent speakers, and we will take everything into consideration in the future. Uh, so we closed session four, and I hand over uh, the mic to the host to give the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bharat. Excellent summary of uh, the whole speeches. Anyway, we'll go, go for closing remarks. I invite Dr. Uh, Srikant Murthy, uh, Vice Chancellor, Sri Satisai University of Human Excellence, Nevini Hill, Karnataka, India. Please, over to Dr. Srikant Murthy. Thank you. Om Shri Sai Ram. Very good afternoon to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. I shall be presenting the conclusions derived from the two-day international conference on post-pandemic reforms in medical education for accessible and affordable rural health care. The inauguration of the conference was held on 17 July in the presence of Sadhguru Shri Matsudan Sai a number of esteemed doctors and dignitaries from the medical profession 
and the leadership team of the Sri Satisa University for Excellence. Sri Mir Narsimurthy, Chancellor of Sri Satisa University for Human Excellence, gave the introductory remarks where he spoke about taking medical education to the villages instead of uprooting students from their heartlands. Thereafter, the guest of honor, Padma Sri Awadi, Dr. Sri N. Manjunath, cardiologist and the director of the Sri Jaydeva Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences and Research, and Dr. Vivek Jowli, chief cardiothoracic and vascular surgeon, chairman at Fortis Hospitals, share their thoughts on the importance of affordable healthcare services and medical education. The keynote address was then given by Dr. Padma Shri Awardee, Dr. Professor Dr. M. S. Veliathan, through video presentation. He was the former president of the Indian National Science Academy and National Research Professor of the Government of India. He spoke about the current gaps in access to medical education and healthcare in rural section and recommended using technology to prevail upon the acute shortage of medical educators. Followed by which our founder, Sri Sadhguru Sri Matsudan Sai, spoke on the human aspect, saying our healthcare stands for compassion and it is for the rural, of the rural and by the rural, and that our vision should be helping healthcare reach the rural doorstep. He urged the millions of doctors of Indian origin practicing in the US to contribute their services to India using virtual treatment and cement the gap to a good extent. The conference held four sessions on the topics, affordability of medical education, accessibility of medical education, acceptability of medical education, and quality of medical education. The key takeaways of the sessions are as follows. There is a critical need for the re-examination of the current policies and infrastructure requirements for accreditation of medical institutes. Public-private partnerships and resources sharing helps reduce cost and improve the quality of medical education. Providing free or low-cost medical education positively impacts the values, lifestyles, lifestyle choices, and healthcare services provided by inspired medical graduates. Ensuring that Non-academic criteria such as aptitude, sense of social responsibility, et cetera, are included in choosing the candidates for medical education is extremely essential. It is indeed possible to achieve the so goal of the free medical education if the three entities, Sarkar, Samaj, and Samstha work hand in hand. There are several challenges plaguing medical education, such as physical shortages, mall distribution, lack of technology, etc. Pipeline programs such as science camps and incentivized training for learners in rural communities can address these challenges. The field of medicine needs adopt an integrative approach incorporating the best of global tradition systems. Medical institutes must revive and promote the traditional Indian systems of medicine such as Ayurveda, and the Siddha systems developed by the Indian physicians such as Charaka and Shushuta. There is also a need for the exploration of the historical aspects, current research and advancements, and the value added by these systems of medicine. The use of technology-based education, such as the use of artificial intelligence, augmented reality, etc., can help us achieve cost-effective training of medical professionals. The use of Ayurveda in modern Medicine has repeatedly proved it's effective in prevention, treatment, restoration. Medical teachers are most critical in ensuring the quality of the next generation of clinicians and the failure in valuing good teachers is perhaps at the core of the crisis of modern medicine. Both external and internal audits are equally important in ensuring quality standards of medical institutes. However, it is even more important to always to provide quality education and healthcare services rather than looking good in audits or internal or external. Patients and public involvement in healthcare professional education, semi-structured interviews with stakeholders, response reports from students and teachers can act as 
key feedback methods to ensure and improve institution quality and trust. Ultimately, quality, non-commercial, value-added medical education and healthcare facilities should reach the underprivileged section. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Murthy. It's an excellent closing remarks. With that, I hand over the course to give closing remarks. Thank you. I just started. Okay, that's fine. Thank you much. Indeed, that was a very enriching session. We thank all our co-chairs, as well as the panelists, and all the speakers who joined us virtually to be a part of the session. Um, we would now like to request Dr. Srikantamurthy to extend a token of our love and gratitude to our speakers. First, to Dr. Pratab. Dr. Srikantamurthy, please. Okay, Dr. Srikantamurthy, if you could please hand over the token of our love first to Dr. Snehal. <laughs> to Dr. Snehal. And also to Dr. Snehal, please. And we request all of you to please stay for a group photo. Thank you very much. And with that, we conclude session four.